So <clears throat> growing up, I, uh, I grew up going to church as a kid, and especially on Easter. How many of you ever went to church on Easter as a kid? Anybody do that? Yeah? If you've done that, it's kind of fun. If you didn't, it's always interesting. I, that was the one time uh, that my mom made me wear a three-piece suit. Uh, it was the only, in fact, I think we only bought it for Easter. <laughs> it was pretty great. Like the, I had the whole thing going on. And, uh, and we would go, and I remember thinking as a kid, I was like, uh, you know, we went to church regularly, but I remember thinking as a kid, Easter always felt a little bit different. Everybody was kind of dressed to the nines. Um, everybody was, you know, excited. We got free donuts, which you will get today if you haven't already had it. Like we did all these things, which is great. Uh, but I was most interested in like the Easter Bunny and what video game I was going to get for my Sega. You know what I mean? Like there's a little bit of that as a kid. And uh, but Easter was interesting though, is when we would go, everything just felt like kind of perfect-ish uh, on Easter. And uh, and at the end of the day, I remember telling my mom this as a kid. I was like, but I know these people aren't perfect. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a little bit of that where it just kind of felt uh, like a little bit of a disconnect. And so several years ago, we we made that video uh, and. And we made it because at the end of the day, if you're here and there's a kind of perfection thing or everything is going great thing, the, the truth is, we all know this about each other, that we're deeply human and we're deeply flawed. And most of us um, have these like high moments and low moments. Most of us have had like even this year, like moments of pain and heartbreak. And you've seen that sort of thing. Many of you are walking uh, with people through difficult things. There's all sorts of things that are connected uh, to our humanity. And what's fascinating to me about Easter in particular, especially within Christianity and churches, is oftentimes the Easter day in particular kind of feels like we gloss over your humanity, but your humanity is at the crux of Christianity. In fact, most of what we're going to talk about today um, is how at the depths of who we are, like the guts of what Christianity is, is connected to your sort of being a human and all the stuff that comes with it. Now, the other part that's interesting, and I know we asked that question about what story do you wish like were true and that you could be a part of. Uh, one of those things that's interesting to me is when I was growing up, the other thing that was fascinating to me is uh, anybody ever like do like the, the thing where you believed for a second that you might be a superhero or was that just me? Anybody else? <clears throat> there was a time when I was five, six, 17 years old, somewhere in that range where uh, I thought like maybe like, I mean, I've never seen me and Batman in the same place. You know what I mean? Like, there's a little bit of that or... <laughs> Like I, I felt like there was a piece of this, and I'll never forget, I, I mustered up, I don't know if anybody's ever done this, I mustered up belief in myself to believe that I might be Superman and thought that if I believed hard enough that I might be. Uh, so I climbed a ladder and I proved that I wasn't <laughs> pretty quick. There's a part of that too when you're a kid. We actually have like phrases for this where we talk about like belief. And there's a part of this when you're a kid, which I think is so interesting, where you realize pretty early on you can't make yourself believe something. Have you ever experienced this? Like you wish that you could. You try to muster it up or you try to like, you know, one of these kinds of things. You wish that you believed, but you just, you just don't believe in the things that you don't believe in, right? And there's a part that when we're kids, we say this, that we're going to make believe. Do you, which I love this. Like we're going to make believe something, which when you think about it is the best thing because you're making yourself believe something and you're suspending your reality to convince yourself that something is true. And some of you are in the room right now going, well, isn't that what Christians do? <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a little bit of this where you go, hey, uh, you're a little bit of a skeptic. And just, just so we are on the same page, I am a lot of bit of a skeptic. And there's a piece of us now that are wired that way in particular that go, hey, there's a part of Christianity that feels like it's a bunch of people who have like make believed this thing inside of themselves. And I'll tell you this, if, if that's you for the next little bit, we're going to talk about belief in particular, because I don't think it's really all about the belief sort of stuff that you hear a lot of times. And the other part about this is also so interesting is some of you have been a follower of Jesus for a long time. Like, you know, we joked about the flannel graph days and audio adrenaline, those kinds of things. But you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time. But the trajectory of your faith has been some version of this. It's been some version of like high belief early. And then it, it felt like slowly your intellect outpaced your believing. And what happened to your faith is it felt like your faith diminished as your intellect increased, which means that first year of college for you, when you showed up to college and the you know, philosophy guy just like poked at one thing and it all felt like it fell apart. There was a part of you that goes, I still want to believe, but I don't know how to make myself believe something. Thing. And what happened is when you think about this, you've kind of drifted along the way and you want parts of it to be true. But at the end of the day, you, you don't know if it is. And you're not sure if an adult faith matches the childlike faith that you were given as a child. And this is what's so interesting for many of us is Christianity gets wrapped up into all sorts of things. And it gets wrapped up into politics. It gets wrapped up into like big old, you know, sort of belief statements. And it, it gets wrapped up into check boxes of things that you have to believe about parts of the Old Testament, these sort of things. And, you know, you read 
read Leviticus to your, you know, seven-year-old one night, and you go, that was a mistake. You know what I mean? Like, you felt some of that where you just go, like, I don't know what to do with some of this. It's like, do I have to think about Noah's Ark the same way as I think about, you know, the, the parts of the New Testament? You go, how do I even, you know, sort of do those things? And what's fascinating for me, and this is what we'll spend a little bit of our time talking about, is we're going to simplify what Christianity is really all about because it's not about a book that you were handed that you believe everything just kind of blindly with. It really centers on one person, and Christianity centers around Jesus. In fact, if Jesus doesn't show up and if we don't, you know, if we don't experience what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes, you're, you're not here. Christianity isn't really a thing. Jesus would have been just like any other rabbi that you know nothing about from the you know, early you know, 2,000 years ago. There's many of those people that you would know nothing about. Christianity really just comes down to one question. And the one question that Christianity ultimately comes down to for many of us is like, who is Jesus? Like at the end of the day, all of the other stuff that you think about, all the other stuff that you were taught, all the other childlike faith stuff that you were given, even if it's all great and all of it's good, the real question for you and the real question for me centers around one thing. And the one thing that it centers around is who is the person of Jesus. Now, what's fascinating about this is you read through the, the Gospels, the New Testament, you read through like extra biblical literature around the person of Jesus. What you find is on this side of history, we talk about Jesus the Christ, we talk about Jesus the Messiah, we talk about death and resurrection. You know, you've seen every version of like a cross and all these sorts of things. But Jesus was a person. And Jesus lived on the earth thousands of years ago. He was a human. He walked around and he experienced the world in a lot of ways that you experienced the world, right? Now, he didn't have Nike and he didn't have your cool shoes. But at the end of the day, what he had, I mean, he, he experienced the world in the way that you experience the world. We can go to the next one. Like, so the question of like, who is Jesus is so fascinating because what it does is a group of people that were expecting a Messiah, Savior, sort of military leader to come in and make things the way that they thought it should be. And ultimately, and this is, again, what's so fascinating about this group of people is they took the idea of what the Messiah was or what they viewed it to be and they put it in a box that represented them. And they put it in a box that represented what they thought the world could and should look like. And they put it in a box and they said, this is what the Messiah will be like. This is what the Messiah should look like. And then Jesus shows up and it massively looks different. And it massively takes a turn for, in a lot of the, their view, the worst, right? Now, what, what was happening then is many, for, it's true for many of us now. It's the exact same kind of thing that we do. We take Jesus, and we put him in our own likeness and reflection, right? I, I show this every Easter. It's one of my favorite things. The whole, I look forward to it every year. We have all these versions of Jesus, and Jesus looks good. Am I, am I right? Jesus looks like a good white dude who uses whatever beard oil that you use. I wouldn't know, but many of you do. You know what I mean? There's a little bit of this where it's like he, he's got like an herbal essence flavor. Like he's, and he's very white. Can we just acknowledge, like, how, ma how many Jesuses have you not seen that were not white? You know what I mean? And then what we've done is we've taken Jesus and we, we go, hey, we're going to build entire cathedrals around what this looks like. And you see all these sort of, like, beautiful, and I'm all about it. I love going to see, like, these big cathedrals. We'll go travel and do this sometimes. These massive, beautiful, big cathedrals that are, like, they strike awe and wonder in you. But all the pictures of Jesus, they just look like really good looking white dudes with a great beard. And then you look at this and what you've seen throughout history is all of these different variations of how we interpret Jesus to be, right? All of these sort of pictures around what he looks like and how it is. And, you know, there's even like, you know, there's all, we make it political. You see this all the time. Like Jesus agrees everything with me politically for sure. He looks like I do. He interacts with people. He hates my uncle like I do. There's a little bit of this, like, he feels all the things that you feel and he supports the vast majority of my theological assumptions and political assumptions and people assumptions and all of the things that Jesus should do. And the problem is he's just not. And so every year I show you a picture just to make it weird because Jesus lived thousands of years ago, not in the U.S., not in Dublin, Ohio, and we know from the Gospels and other historical accounts that he kind of looks something I like a version of this. There's a guy named Richard Neve who uh, is, he, he does like facial, you know, you know, sort of recognition, reconstruction stuff from ancient times. And he put this together. Now, again, this isn't Jesus, but a person from the knowledge that we have that would have lived in that area of the world at the time would have looked something like this. He's probably shorter than you think. 
probably much stronger and stockier than you think. He's probably not slender and in the NBA. He's, thank you. I thought it was funny too. I was pretty proud of that one. I was looking forward to that all week and nobody laughed. Thank you. Thank you. I was pretty proud of that. I was like, man, that's going to be good. It wasn't. It wasn't. But thank you. There's a piece of this where you go like, he's not. He was a guy. He was a man that lived in the ancient world. And not only that, but he's a rabbi. And again, this is one of the things you don't, you don't hear when you're a kid. It's like he taught things and he wasn't the only rabbi. There were a lot of rabbis at the time that you know probably nothing about, that you could quote nothing about, many of us. And he would teach subversive things about politics. And his Twitter account would have been very fascinating. And you would have seen all sorts of fun things. And then he did miracles. Now, the other part about this is also interesting is there were other rabbis who seemed to do miracles. It was interesting. So Jesus doing these miracles. He garnered a following. He had a close group of disciples or people who followed so closely they wanted to become like him. He did all of these things. And, and we don't know much about his early life or his like middle years, but we sort of pick up in the story where he... He's doing all of these incredible things, and then he does them, and then he starts talking about, like, ultimately how he's this, you know, this, like, Messiah. When you look at him, you're kind of seeing God. You see all of these sorts of statements that he makes. He begins to garner a lot of enemies at the same time. Now, also not unique to Jesus, right? Rabbis who were viewed as teaching these sort of like insurrection kind of things within the culture, the state takes them and they go, hey, we know how to prove that you're not when you don't exist anymore. Like that's a little bit of how that works. It's like if you think you're the Messiah, we know how to show that you're not. And, and this sort of builds and his sort of group of enemies build. And then even the people that followed him and saw him do miraculous things, a lot of them just sort of disappeared. And a lot of it centers around what he begins to say, not just about God, but about himself. Like we have this moment where he goes and he does this miraculous thing and he's talking to this woman and, and he says this. <laughs> he, says, he says these words, he goes, uh, he says, I am the resurrection and the life, which is a pointing to himself as if, you know, he's the one who can bring about this. He says, the one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he says this, he says, do you believe this? And the answer to that question for most people who were logical and with a brain would go, no, I, I, no, thank you. And you're not the first person to say you're the son of God. You're not the first person to say these sorts of things. You're not the first person to do miracles. You're not the first person to teach subversively against the state. So when he goes, look, I'm the resurrection, I'm the life, you know, there's a little bit of this that you kind of go, I mean, if you were to ask me and you were to ask you, most of us would go, I I don't know. I don't know. And so what ends up happening is all of this begins to build. And most, you know, many of you know the story, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, he ends up being captured. He ends up being taken as a trial and they talk about some of these things and, you know, he's kind of silent and then he's not for a hot second. And if you've never read this, it's so beautiful and so fascinating. But the way that it leads up to, he's going to be killed and he's going to be executed. And what ends up happening here again in 2024, you know, we don't, you see this because of Twitter and the news outlets that'll post this guy. You don't see raw and gory things like this as much more so now than maybe 10 or 15 years ago. But I mean, <laughs> Rome had perfected what this looks like. Rome had perfected what torture looks like. And it, they perfected what sort of heaping shame on an individual looks like. And they perfected what it looks like to suffer until you die. And so he gets sort of taken, he gets beaten and then he gets beaten. There's also this like fascinating little like, you know, you know, tidbit in the text. It was almost like they beat him to the point where they go, is this enough? And the answer was no, I want more. And then what happens after he's beaten to the point where he is likely unrecognizable? He goes and they go to crucify him. And you've seen these. And it, it, it's interesting because you see crosses all the time. Like we grow up seeing crosses. Some of us wear crosses, which is really beautiful. And um, you, you see these decorative. I kind of laugh. Like my grandma had a cross in the bathroom, which when you pause, you're just kind of sitting there, which is awkward. And then you go, that's a torture device and an execution device. Like at, at the core of it on this side of history, it's beautiful and it's meaningful. But at the time, it was like when you talk about the cross, it's like, yeah, the electric chair. Yeah, we, we know what that is for a person. Now, many scholars would talk about how Jesus was crucified. And many of the pictures that you have are this majestic thing where he's like eight or nine feet in the air and all of the guards are underneath him, you know. 
and all the people watching or around, but they're all kind of looking up. And as gruesome as it can feel, it's also majestic too. I mean, it is a little bit like he's on the cross and you, especially if you're following Jesus, you feel like you know what's going to happen and it's like a little bit. But most scholars would say like that's not what the cross looked like. In fact, it wasn't like up high. Many people would say this. It was, it was more like eye level when you were to hang someone on a cross. And you would hang them on a cross because there was also a shame connection to this. And so at eye level, people could walk by and spit on you. And at eye level, they could watch your body gasp for air. At eye level, you could see the person suffer up close. And this is what it felt like. This is what it was. This is what the cross is. It's not majestic. It's not pretty. It's not awe and wonder. It's the man, Jesus, suffocating and dying. And then part of this that I didn't get growing up, uh, and then I don't know that you do get until you're a parent. We're, just real quick, where are the parents at in the room? We have parents in the room. So you go, yeah. so parents, you know this. Uh, until we had Henry, um, the, the Easter after we had Henry, it was the first time I ever really thought about this, but I thought to myself, like, his mom was there, right? Like, I remember the first time Henry fell down and, like, scratched his leg. I turned into a freaking Jedi. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I got there so fast, it was unreal. And I felt a weird level of pain that I never felt as a dad. Now, you, you know, this is like, those are your parents. Like, there's something about that. You go, like, it's just different. There's something about it that's like deep connection. I can never imagine what a mother would, would go through watching their son at eye level suffocate for that long. And what's so interesting about the Gospels and what's interesting about the writers of the New Testament is you see, like, it's, it's not something he deserved. He lived this, like, sinless life. This is what is attributed to Jesus, that he didn't deserve this thing. He's dying on the cross, knowingly doing this on behalf of humanity. And we talk about it in terms of humanity or the world. Like, many of you grew up, like, memorizing, like, for God so loved the where all do you get it? Like, it feels a little bit distant, like he did it for everybody. But then there's also this weird component that you go, like, when you think about the cross, it's also not the whole world. It, it is, but it's, it's you. And it, it's me. Like, he died on the cross for Patrick, Donovan Holden. Somebody asked me my middle name today. I'm glad I could insert that in. Yeah. He died for me. And this is the part where I'm like, in all of the ways that we romanticize it, it's a public execution that's focused on shame in front of his mother and a few of his closest followers. Now, what's so fascinating, too, about this is that he kind of called it shot. So you read through the Gospels and you see, like, he talks about this idea. <clears throat> because rabbis don't die on the cross and raise from the dead, no one's standing around waiting for him to come back. In fact, they almost have this, like, makeshift like last minute grave that they sort of put him in and they roll the stone that would have weighed several tons and they put him in there and they go through the entire process to get him into the tomb. <laughs> and I, I say this like every Easter, like as a joke and also like, it's also very true. But if I believed that someone was going to die and raise from the dead and I had a general idea of when it was going to happen, like I would show up with a lawn chair and some popcorn and some of you would bring a keg. You know what I mean? Like, you're ready to go. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're about to look out at these guys and go, hey, Roman soldiers, you don't understand. You're about to have a bad day, you know? <laughs> like, I'd bring a background organ. Anybody grew up Pentecostal? Be like, well, you know, I'm like, we're going to take off running. I grew up Pentecostal. I can make that joke. I'm like, I'm about to, like, get slain and whatever. Like, it was going to be off. Like, I'm ready to go. And you know what? No one was. Nobody. His mother's not sitting there. Nobody's sitting there. Nobody. Like the Braves played the Phillies yesterday, and I wore a jersey and had a Braves popcorn bucket with every human in my house dressed out to the nine in Braves attire, and they won. Bryce Harper, thank you so much. They did this sort of thing. I am that level of petty. No one is at the tomb waiting for the rabbi to raise from the dead. And this is what's so interesting is going, and I said this earlier, what makes the, the historical accounts that we have of Jesus partly so fascinating is the day that he died is the day that there were no more Christ followers in existence. Like no one's sitting around going, hey, it's going to happen. It's gonna, you ready? Are you coming? Seeing out calendar invites on Google. Nothing. 
They're in hiding. You know why they're in hiding? Because when you take out a person who causes or is viewed to cause like this insurrection of things, you take out the rest of the people with him. Like Peter, who's like, you know, he's a little bit like very excitable. <laughs> to the best of our knowledge, as we look at these passages, there were like these young middle school-ish girls who would go like, hey, you're that guy that used to follow him. And he's like, no, 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 I'm Simon. That's Peter. Like a little bit different. Like you're thinking of the other. doppelganger. Yes, but that's another dude. There's a little bit of that. And he denies him multiple times. The other disciples, many of them go into hiding. Like there's just, no one's waiting. And then you, you get the account. They're like, after three days, he's not dead anymore. It's like he's, he's risen, which is why Easter's a thing. Right? Like he's risen. And this is the part about Christianity. Somebody said earlier today, I thought it was somebody that like, you know, Easter's kind of like the Super Bowl of Christianity. And it kind of is. And the fact that like we get real hyped about the fact that he's not dead anymore. Now, here's the part for those of you who are skeptical, and I totally get this. That feels like make-believe. Like you wouldn't say this out loud because you're kind most, most of the time, at least in person, maybe not online. But there's a part of this where you would say this, Right? The deeper assumption for you is that there are people who experience similar life problems that you have that make believe, make themselves believe something that we can't know. And you know what? I get, I get that. And the gospel accounts are fascinating. And this is what I tell people all the time. This is part of the reason we started a church, right? Because I'd go to churches and I would sit there and I'd hear people talk. Don't tell anybody else I said this. And I'd go, that's, that's not intellectual faith. That's mustering up and make-believe. You don't know why you think that. And it bothered me. It bothered me because you're thoughtful. It bothers me because people who were followers of Jesus, it's not that they mustered it up. There's a reason that throughout history, smart people believe that a rabbi died on the cross. And he rose from the dead. And it's not because of a book. It's not because they picked up something at Barnes and Noble that has leather on it. And it's the best-selling book of all time. I always like, it's an anthology. Like there's poetry in it, and there's historical parts of it, and there's allegory, and then there's beautiful parts of it that you go like, you can't read that until you're older because of the sex. Like there's that sort of thing too. Like there's all parts of this that make it so deeply human and so powerful. It's not a book. In fact, the gospels that we have, and the reason that so many people believe this in part is because these were people that experienced Jesus the man. And they didn't assume that he would raise from the dead, and then he did, and they go, What now? There's an area of the Bible called John. And John's kind of like the feeler of the group, a little bit. And you get all these like interesting details. And he chronicles what happens around the resurrection. John chapter 20, here's what it says. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So let me just pause for a second. If you don't know about Mary Magdalene, she's one of the followers that kind of came along early to midway through. She would have been the least credible out of everybody because of the decisions she was making, the ways that she was be viewed, also because, in part because she was a woman, Right? Women's testimony at the time didn't hold the same weight, specifically women who had been doing some of the things that she had been doing and had been viewed in the ways that she had been viewed. And nobody talks about this too, but a lot of people talk about like demons and this sort of thing, which you could also talk about. And at the bare minimum, whatever you think about demons, there were, there were views around mental health at the time that would have been attributed to her. And then she gets miraculously healed from some of this. She's the last person that you want to be the spokesperson for the most powerful event ever. And so she's the one that shows up, and she sees that the, the stone had been removed. Now watch this. A lot of people miss this. I think it's so fascinating. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said this, that they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Now don't miss this. This is always so fascinating to me. I love it so much. She doesn't start with, and he rose from the dead. She starts with, they took his body. Her initial response isn't, oh my goodness, he must have been the savior of the world. Her response is, they took him. They've defiled him. 
And I love what happens next, right? It says this. So Peter, right? So Peter, the other disciple, started for, <laughs> for the tomb. Now, the next thing is one of my favorite details in all of, the, all of the Bible. I love this so much. It says, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So this is like my favorite thing. Like Peter, anybody have that like annoying friend who just starts something before they think? Anybody? <laughs> Don't lie. Some of you are sitting next to them. That's great too. You know what I mean? Like, the car's on fire, boom, they're gone. You know what I mean? Like, gotcha. Like, there's a little bit of that. Peter's that guy. So Peter say, takes off running. It's one of my favorite details in all the, <laughs> all the New Testament. It just, it just simply says, Peter and the other guy took off, but Peter was slow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is so much fun. They both go. They're, we're going to the tomb, you know? And like, one guy's like, Usain Bolt makes it. And then Peter's over there like, <laughs> you know, like... I'm an asthmatic, I can make the joke, right? You know I mean, there's a little bit of this where they just go and, and they get there, right? They get to the tomb and then, and then he goes, like, he, says he, he said, uh, he, I get to the tomb first, he bent over, looks, and now as much as you can visualize this, they walk in, he looked at the strips of linen lying there, but he doesn't go in because there's a little bit of this is sacred and where did he go? And, and, and then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb because of course Peter did. You know what I mean? Run straight by him, straight in, and he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, and the cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. And you get this in the next verse. It says, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. And this is so fascinating. He saw and he believed. And this is one of my favorite parts. I love this. That he doesn't muster it up. He sees and he believes. And this is the common thread. The common thread through so many of the people that we would find in terms of the early testimony around what happened, saw, and then they believed. And then you get this other powerful moment with Mary a couple of verses later. It says this about Mary. It says, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white I've never seen an angel. I don't know about it. I don't, I don't understand all that. Like, I watched Touched by an Angel as a kid. Anybody else see that? Like, Tess? <laughs> Roma Downey? My first crush. Anyway, so there's a little bit of that. That's not true. Pink Ranger from Power Ranger. Anyway, so there's a little bit of this. I saw the two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they look at her and they ask her this, like, woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Almost as if to say, like, didn't you expect this? He, he. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Still, she's not on board with the whole, like, and then he rose from the dead. And it says, at this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Now, this is another part of the narrative that I think is so fascinating, but they don't care to clarify. I don't know why she didn't know it was Jesus. I think it's interesting. Anybody ever cried so hard that you had trouble seeing? Anybody? Yeah. All you guys are like, no. I saw you at that Ohio State-Michigan game. I know what happened. <laughs> don't lie. You know what that's like. I don't know if that was it. I don't know what it was. She doesn't know. She's not aware. She's so caught up in whatever she's caught up in that she doesn't realize that it's Jesus talking to her. And he asks her, and he says the same question. Why, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And I love this. Thinking that he was the gardener, mistaking Jesus for the gardener, she says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And this is one of the most powerful parts of the New Testament. It's one word that comes next. It's, it's the one word that I think is so fascinating that it shifts everything about her. If I was God, I'll just tell you, if I'm Jesus and I died and I kind of called my shot, and I was kind of like hoping you'd be there for it. You know what I mean? Like, I told you, and then nobody's there. I'm low-key frustrated. I'm, I'm personally low-key, and by low-key, I mean high-key frustrated at all people that's not there. I, I would want to logically say, here's what happened. Here's what I did. This is not what we find next. Jesus' response to her is simply her name. He just says, Mary. And when he says her name, the fullness, I don't know, this is the fullness and the reality that she was in, that rabbis don't die and raise from the dead, that's true. Rabbis don't rise from the dead. Jesus the Christ 
rises from the dead. And again, she believes not because she mustered it up, not because she made herself believe. She believed because she saw him. Many of you, if you've been around church, know about like the Great Commission, like go into all the world, make disciples. What's so fascinating that I think is so interesting is you almost get like a, a small version of this right out the gate with Mary. Jesus says to her, she said, he says this, don't, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers. I love this. Go to my brothers. All the ones hiding right now. I want you to go tell them. I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. <laughs> it's so interesting. It's, just, it's always funny about women preaching. I grew up in context. Like, I don't do that. I was like, kind of Mary did. Kind of Mary did. You know, like. Kind of the person that held the fullness of the truth of the gospel of like he's not here anymore. Yeah, it was it was her that went out. Leonard Sweet, uh, who's like a theologian and philosophical writer, I love. He tweeted this. I thought it was so good. I almost just like, would you come speak? That'd be great. But here's what he said: he said There's a magic moment in time. And only one person in the whole world, one person walking planet Earth knew the good news of he's alive, the ultimate breaking news that would forever change the course of humanity. And for that brief sacred instant, this one person was the whole church. Now just stop, just think about this for a second. There was a moment in history where one person, Mary Magdalene, in the narrative of all of this, the, and often the least credible person of all of them to know knew this truth. The whole Jesus story hinged on what that one person would do with the truth. Would she cherish it and keep it to herself or would she share it with others and become, and I love this, the apostle to the apostles. The one that would share the, the truth of the gospel to all of them. And again, don't miss this. Not because she mustered up belief or she made belief, but because she saw and she knew and then she would go and share. Now, there's one other part that I think is fascinating. I think it's the one I most identify with out of all of the people who found out first, right? The whole group of people that found out first. And it's almost like a, it almost feels on this side of history like a stereotypical kind of thing. There's a guy named Thomas who was one of the closest followers of Jesus at the time. So he would have seen Jesus do the miraculous stuff. He would have heard the teaching of Jesus. He would have seen all of these sorts of things. Many of you like doubting Thomas, which is always fascinating, which I think is so, so interesting. And so you have this Thomas person that's connected to all of this. And here's what happens. This is John's account of what Thomas would have said here. So now Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the other disciples when Jesus comes. So he comes, Jesus comes, shows up. All these miraculous things happen with the disciples. Uh, but Thomas wasn't there. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. We've seen him. Like, I'm prob- look, look, look we, I saw him. But it's kind of like that friend. You ever felt this? Like a friend who's like, I went to the U2 concert and I met Bono. And you're like, shut up. You know what I mean? There's a little bit of that. Like, no, you didn't. Like, there's an immediate skepticism. And maybe it's skepticism around the people that are telling him. Maybe it's a skepticism around the reality that was true, that rabbis don't die on the cross and raise back from the dead. Maybe that's what it is. And so what Thomas says next, which I love, Thomas says, look, unless I see marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And this is fun. Can I just, this is a slightly missed thing because it hits, um, I think, one of the big objections. What Thomas is saying is, look, it's not that if Jesus showed up, I wouldn't believe. You could bring Jesus here, but that's not it. I want to see like the, 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 the nail sort of thing. I, I want to see the piercing. I think he might be fooling us. I think this all may be a farce. I think this might not be true. Even if Jesus showed up, it's not that. I want to see the Jesus who was nailed. I want to see the Jesus who they pierced his side in the water, like the confirmation of the death Jesus. And the real truth and reality around this, which is so true from his current reality, was this, that Thomas has spent the last three years of his life following a false rabbi who let him down. Like, this this was Thomas's view. Like, we went three years with this guy, the miracle sort of thing, sure, like, all of this, yeah, that's all great, but come on. I'm looking at him, and they killed him like they killed the other ones, and he said that he was the one, and he didn't. Thomas is like, no, not today, Satan. You know what I mean? Like, there's a little bit of that, like, I don't believe, I don't trust him. And at the end of the day, the other part that, again, I love it when people talk about this a little bit, but it wasn't just the person of Jesus, but the system and the structure 
and disappointment had led him to be a version of a skeptic. That he had followed him and it didn't work out. He had followed him and it seemed like it wasn't real. He had followed him and it wasn't the case. And so what happens is a week later, right, we see Jesus then reveal himself to Thomas. And it's one of my, it's just so great. Here's what what it says in verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Now, I love the way this gets talked about. It says, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Which is what you say to a group of people when you randomly show up in the room and the doors are locked, Right? When you scare the mess out of your friends, at some point you go, my bad. You know, there's a little bit of that. And Jesus just shows up. And then it says this. <laughs> Jesus says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And you know what's fun about this? This was so fun. So I wish I could have, again, for people that I listened to Easter sermons with when I was growing up. And that's this. Jesus never neglects the intellectual pursuit that Thomas had. He doesn't. He doesn't put that aside. Jesus could have just been like, look. He said, I want you to take your hand and put it here. Why? Because is that what you need to know? He doesn't neglect the intellectual pursuit at all. In fact, he leans into it. There is no part of the New Testament, no part of the writers of the New Testament that talk about you checking your brain at the door. They're just not. There's no part of it that's just like, oh, and now I believe. It's not, it's not that. There's no part of you that has to get dumber to trust God. He and the disciples that would follow and the early church Believe this because of evidence and what they believed that they saw. And so Thomas' response, which again is so fascinating, so beautiful, so powerful. He says, my Lord and my God. Now again, this is what makes it so interesting to me. This is why Thomas is so fascinating to me. Is the part of you that feels like God is distant and savior of the world and all of the church, and all of Christianity, and all of the people, and we gather here with hundreds of you today doing this. All of that is good. I believe all of that is true. And yet, he comes for you. Not just everybody. He came for you. And the other part that's so fascinating is he, he loves you. Does he love everybody? Sure, yes. And also, he loves you. So if you're here and you go like, hey, my block and my barrier is an intellectual thing, great. Lean into that. I'll tell you what frustrates me. This is the thing that like, if I, as a pastor, I never get frustrated with people who have doubts and questions about their faith. I love it. Sometimes I ask questions to spur it on. Like I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of you being an adult human being with faith. What bothers me is like the like 17 second TikTok video that's extraordinarily articulate and wildly stupid that doesn't talk about what the actual things are. Your soundbite around why Christianity is untrue and why for millennia people don't believe this is cute and wildly misinformed. There are smart people throughout all of history who believe in Jesus, not the rabbi, but Jesus, the Christ. And so I would say, you bring the fullness of your humanity. You bring the fullness of your questions. You bring the fullness of your intellectual pursuit. But until you do, Recognize that like any other thing, you've just distanced yourself from make-believe things that aren't about make-believe. People who are followers of Jesus have done this, and it's very specific. They've decided to trust and follow. And this is different, because that's not about certainty. That's about evidence. 
It's about people who would go like, at the end of the day, I don't just trust and follow because I mustered it up. I chose to trust and follow based off of evidence. I trust and follow because I believe that Jesus is active in the world now. I trust and follow because I believe in the tangible presence of Jesus now. And the testimony of one woman, the testimony of the early followers of Jesus, the disciples. A lot of people don't talk about this, but then Jesus shows up and appears to hundreds of people in different pockets of the ancient world. And then Paul would write about this later in Corinthians. And what he would talk about was like, he would give very specific people and places that experienced Jesus. Which is kind of like this. I said this a few years ago. It's kind of like saying, hey, well, you, you know Doug over in Marysville, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I know Doug. Doug saw him. And you're like, wait a minute. I don't believe that. And if you didn't believe it, you go like, ask Doug, Doug, whatever. Like, you're, you're going to do this. The, the, the clarity with which the gospels talk about this, the clarity with which the people talked about this is so high. I'm telling you, it's not about mustering anything up. It is about looking at evidence and understanding and deciding for yourself and leaning into that and trust and following Jesus. So the way that John ends this passage is fun, uh, for me at least. Uh, I love when they're just super clear about why they did it. Uh, what John says in verse 30, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. And then he says this, he says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And then he says this, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now you might experience the freedom of what resurrection is. Resurrection isn't about getting out of hell free cards. It's not about you just mustering something up to be on God's good side. It's not about getting a free genie who answers all your prayers the way you want it to be. It's about experiencing the powerful, redemptive, resurrection work of Jesus in the here and now with you and the way that he's redeeming the whole world. Now, I'll say one last thing and then I'm going to tell you a story and we'll wrap up. But um, for those of you who are skeptical, my favorite thing to tell people that are skeptical around Christianity, specifically Jesus, is this. When you look at what actually happened, the historical evidence around this, um, what we know, I think, for a fact is that something miraculous happened with this group of people that made this guy different. The things happened here. And there's a Japanese writer who has this sort of beautiful paragraph around what this looks like that I want to read to you. Here's what he says. He says, if you don't believe in the resurrection, then you will be forced to believe that something hit the disciples or these closest followers of Jesus. It was every bit as amazing, maybe different, yet of equal force and its electrifying intensity, which I think is so fascinating. Just to say, like, something happened that changed the course of people and history. Something happened to these guys. Something happened to these women. Something happened to them. He says, for if we try to explain the changed lives of the early Christians, now again, if you've never looked into the early Christians, just the history, you should look, look into that. Look into what they did. Look at the way that they stood. Anyway, you can. For if we try to explain the changed lives of the early Christians, you will find yourself making leaps of faith as great as if you had believed in the resurrection to start with. And can I say this is what's so interesting to me? Because I'm a history person. I love this. I'll just say this. I think one of the most thoughtful things that skeptics can do is to go read about what the early Christians, the first hundred to 200 years of the early church and the early Christians did. And when you look at this, it becomes so, I think, so evident that at the bare minimum, something powerful happened. And then I think the next question is, what happened? Who is Jesus? And why do they believe in a resurrection? All right, this is where we're going to end our time today.
Um, when I was uh, in high school, I, uh, some of you heard me talk about this before. I don't think I've ever told you why. Uh, I, I've told you a lot. I love to hang out with people who are much, much, much older than me, right? This is my, like, 80s, 85. I've hung out with a few people, like, well into their 90s on. And it started for me in high school because uh, I had a, a project, which was a fascinating project. I grew up in South Carolina, 49th in the nation education, but we'll leave that there. And my project was to go to a senior citizen's home and to talk to them and get their life story. And I was, that was the last thing I wanted to do, <laughs> and I did. And so I took my little uh, notebook and my Jansport backpack. Anybody remember those? Yeah. Anybody got those? Come on. Still, I, it still works. Best $33 I've ever spent. And so I, that's not true. Um, but I showed up, and, um, and when I was 16, what I did is I played music a lot. So I was, uh, I led worship, I did this sort of thing. So I'd show up to these places, and, and they liked 16-year-olds who could come play hymns. And that's what I would do. And I'd show up to these places, and then I would hang out with them afterwards. And uh, I'd hear the story. And so I played in one time, uh, and they had these like, little chapels at these places. And there's a guy on the third row, uh, I come to find out he's like high 80s, like 86, 87. And if you've ever heard anybody like that old sing, it's so fascinating to me. I love it, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's crackly. It's, he's struggling for breath a little bit. Like it was just an interesting thing. It was just so powerful, but he was so passionate. And the song that I was leading uh, was a song called Because He Lives. And the only reason I was leading it is because it was one of the only hymns I knew. And I was playing it because my mom would play that. And so she taught people how to play these hymns and stuff. That's what we did growing up. And as we were doing this, um, he was just singing it out. And so I got to hang with him afterwards. And I'll never forget talking to him about this. Now, I grew up in church. Uh, I gave my life to Christ early on. We talked about the whole, like, for God to love the world, kind of a distant thing. And there were moments where it felt personal and then moments where it felt distant. Like, that's just how my faith was early and has been at times since then. And so I'm sitting with this guy afterwards, and I'm, I'm talking to him. And as we're talking uh, about this, he starts talking about how when our faith is distant or disconnected, he starts talking about essentially what it means to be a practical agnostic who doesn't want to go to hell. This is kind of what he was really hitting at. And then he gets emotional in the midst of this. And he says, and he starts talking to me, he's like, at the end of the day, Jesus loves the world. Yeah. And then he leans in and he goes, but he did all of that for you. And I thought to myself, I was like, oh, that's great. I mean, it almost felt like a goodwill hunting, which I'm not, a, you know, emotions. You know what I mean? A little bit of that. Like, it felt like this moment. And then he says it again. And and he starts talking about this, like, personal component of faith. And the more that I thought about it, I thought to myself, I'm never going to check my brain at the door. I'm just not wired to do that. And every time I hear people not intellectually engage with it or they just, you know, that bothers me. I know, that, I know it bothers you too, but it's a part of that. But when I listen to him talk about Jesus, Jesus wasn't an idea. Jesus wasn't a framework. Jesus wasn't a discipline. Jesus wasn't a set of like reading my Bible for a quiet time and it wasn't about a song. It was about a person. And a person that didn't just exist back then, but a person who is present in his life today. And I'll say this to you. I think for those of you in the room who are deeply skeptical about Christianity, and I mean this, <clears throat> I'm not about to have you pray a prayer and muster it up to try to do make-believe today. I'm not. And also, I would tell you this, the greatest pursuit that you'll ever do with your mind is to determine whether or not he's alive. And look at your own evidence. He is not afraid of your questions. And anytime somebody makes you feel like you can't ask the questions, that's not of God. We serve Jesus who showed up to the disciples who didn't show up for him. And I believe he'll do that for you if you lean in and figure out, why do I believe these things? One of my favorite things to tell skeptics is this, and I mean this. Develop your theology on why you don't believe that he rose from the dead. But you got to look at both sides of the argument. Be very articulate about why you've chosen not to follow Jesus and why you don't believe that he rose from the dead. Now, I think that's a group of you in the room. There's another group of you in the room that at some point along the way believed, but then you deconstructed your faith. 
or there's another component of you where you go like, there's a part of you that your child faith just didn't grow with you. I talked about this earlier, like you just outgrew what you were given. And you were, and I get that. It feels like make-believe to you. And I'll tell you this, if that's you, (laughs) some of you have done this. You've began to intellectualize your faith to the point where you have created a, a space where you don't, or you don't allow yourself to have the capacity to feel any of it anymore. And there's bits and pieces of it that feel nostalgic. Like you heard the songs today, and whether you like the songs or not, it feels nostalgic to be at church on Sunday. And you know the story of the resurrection, and whether you agree with it or not, it feels nostalgic to hear those things again. But there's a part of you that kind of wants it to be true. But intellectually, you're just like, I've just created enough barriers. And the real honest truth that I would say to you Is that actually the reason that you're not a follower of Jesus? Or are you a little bit like Thomas and you're just a little pissed? Like you outgrew part of your life or the intellectual thing just outgrew that and life didn't go the way that you wanted to. I think all the intellectual questions you have are true. And also, is that really why you're not following Jesus? And one of the best things that you could ever do is answer the question, what's the real reason? Because some of you have just chosen to distance yourself from Christianity in general. Because you feel let down, or you feel a little bit better than. And neither one of those things is the actual reality of the world. And the last group is this. And then we're going to wrap up here in a second. The last group is this. I've been a follower of Jesus for a long time. You prayed a prayer when you were a kid. And as I talked about, like, Jesus loving the whole world, that's, that's true for you and good. But it has been a long time a long time, when you embrace it and recognize and allow yourself to understand and know that Jesus also loves you. That Jesus went to the cross for you. That he rose from the dead for you. And really in all of the narrative, you're like, you're the Mary. That you're waiting for him to say your name. And he is. He loves the whole world. But he also loves so here's how we're going to wrap up our time. And it's going to be a little bit odd for some of us, and I get that. And it might feel a little bit, a little bit different for some of us. But I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to ask if you would to, to stand for me for just a second. And here's how we're going to end it. My hope for you, if you're in like that first group, can we just be really honest and blunt about it? You're at a church, so you kind of had to know I was going to say this. But if you're in the first group and the deep part of you is like skeptical of the whole thing, that's okay. And maybe today your next step is for you to make a commitment to at least unpack why you're at the place that you are. One of the best things that you could do over the next three months, six months, nine months, or a year is become wildly articulate around why you think Jesus didn't rise from the grave. I'd love for you to do that. For those of you who it's actually like there's a barrier for you and it's been a long time for you and you just go like, I I don't believe, but it's more than an intellectual pursuit. It's like deeper than that. That's okay too. But what I'm going to ask you to do just for a second is what I'm going to ask you to do is maybe today go, hey, I'm actually going to choose to trust and follow because it's time for you to trust and follow. Not muster belief up, but trust the evidence and follow Jesus. And then for those of you in the room, and this is the whole other stuff side, you're like, it's been a long time since you recognize that Jesus loves you. You haven't experienced his presence in a long time. It's felt distant. Maybe this Easter for the first time with all the eggs and candy and bunnies and dropping things out of the sky and donuts after the service, and wherever you're going to go eat. Maybe the, the core for you and the next step for you is to go, I'm going to lean in not to the idea of Jesus, the framework of Christianity, but the person of Jesus in my life. So I'm going to invite the band to come up. We'll do one last song before we wrap up. And what we're going to sing is a song called uh, Because He Lives. We're going to do that. And then we're going we're gonna to end and kind of go into what a beautiful name. But here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask you if you would to close your eyes for a second. I'm going I'm to pray for us. And uh, then we'll wrap up our time together. Father, we thank you for days like today where we get to come and celebrate what you did on our behalf. We thank you for days like today where we get to remember who you are and what you've done for us. And we get to celebrate that we believe that you're not dead, that you rose from the dead and that you did for us what we could never do on our own. 
So I pray for the person in the room that's a skeptic and uh, every part of them resisted what we said today and they have reasons, but they, they're not reasons that go super deep in them yet. And so I just ask that you would help them to do that. At the bare minimum, to be very, very, very articulate around why they've chosen not to follow you. And in that process, what I pray is that you disrupt that and that you reveal yourself to them however you choose to do it in the ways that you did it for others. Got to pray for the person that's been a long time uh, since they've maybe followed you or they've pulled apart parts of their faith, but it's kind of like hanging by a thread and they know why, but they're kind of distant, but it's four layers deep, they're actually just hurt. Or four layers deep, they're actually like frustrated. Or four layers deep, they feel like you let them down. There's an expectation gap or whatever that is. God, I just ask right now that even in their head, they would just simply say, Jesus, I choose to trust and follow you and that they would, that they would trust you with their life. And then for all of us in the room, God, I pray that you would remind us that you didn't just die for the whole world. You didn't just come back for a peace. God, you, you want us personally, individually. And I pray that it becomes so personal for all of us and that we would choose to follow you and that as we do, God, you would show yourself faithful in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray.